A couple of today's stories are especially violent, featuring dangerous legends that turned out to be deadly. A couple of other stories feature the unexplained. Really, this is an assortment of different stories, basically an excuse for me to be less picky about submissions for a day and catch up on stories I haven't been able to narrate yet. Be forewarned, I am not exactly a big believer in the last story, but it's a fun one nonetheless. Now, I've got in mind some upcoming topics such as summer stories, RV or camper encounters, and creepy things seen out in open water. Go to darkstories.org to send me your stories, and check out Freaky Folklore on your favorite podcast app. Now, let's begin. The Pasanta from Black Cat 1206. Whether this story is 100% true or just another old wives' tale, made up by aging family members to scare us kids to behave, it had the desired effect. Because even being modern, streetwise urban kids, we always made sure at least one of us shut and locked all the windows and, when we were very young, left a saucer of milk out in the garden to appease the pasanta and its dark, nocturnal motives. For context, my family are Londoners, born and bred, but we have quite a mixed heritage. My gran was born in Waterford, Ireland, but moved with her family to Paddington, London, when she was just 18 months old. Grenda, which is what all us grandkids called him, was born in Ladbroke Grove before it was a wealthy place as it is now, to a Spanish London father and a mother from Gateshead in the north. The area was a working-class area back in the late 20s. When Granda was four, he went to live with his grandmother and aunties back in Gateshead. His youngest auntie, Bella, was only six months older than Granda, and it was Bella who told us the story of the Pasanta. By the time I was born, Granda had already passed, but our great-great-auntie Bella outlived him by 18 years, and I remember as a little child listening to Bella's ghouly stories, as she used to say, being both terrified and mesmerized by her traditional folklore tales that their Catalan-born father told them. There was a story about a family who was terrorized by the Pasanta, or Pesante. It was set as a common cultural belief at the time it supposedly happened, and was as familiar as an urban legend to the kids then as Slender Man is to the kids today. A giant, black, hairy dog or cat, smelling like sulfur, sneaks into open windows in the depth of the night. It terrorizes and harasses the young and aged of the family. And with the stronger members, it sits on their chests, crushing the oxygen from their lungs and the will from their limbs. They also are known to give the victims horrendous night terrors and, in general, are omens of misfortune or even death. The story goes... On arriving back from a night away from home, as he had slept over at his friend Alex's house, eight-year-old Bernabe observed that the family house was eerily quiet, and still the front door was locked. When his mother didn't open the door for him, and he got no answer, he climbed through his grandmother's open bedroom window. Young Bernabe happened upon a horrible sight. His beloved grandmother was quivering, gibbering, and insensible in the corner of her own room. Horrified, Bernabe ran out, screaming, Mama! Poppy! He ran into his parents' bedroom and immediately began to scream. Hanging halfway off his parents' bed was the lifeless body of his mother, the pallor of her skin an awful shade of blue. Her lungs had been crushed. It looked as though an enormous pressure had been applied to her chest. Bernabe looked around in sheer panic at his baby sister's crib, she was there, of course. Little Lila was lying flat on her back, her skin the same color as their mother's. She had suffocated to death like someone or something had just sucked the air right out of her. She had only been 18 months old. He ran around the house calling out for his father, but his father was conspicuously absent. Bernabe then just ran to the nearest neighbors to get help. Later that afternoon, Bernabe's father was found roaming near the forest. He was very dazed and confused, and just kept repeating two words. La pesante, la pesante. 
not managing to find any further suspects for the two murders, and not being able to get anything remotely sensible from the only surviving witness to the abominable crimes, the police had no choice but to charge the poor father of the family. He had gone totally insane since that afternoon. Instead of jail, he was certified as not being mentally culpable for the murders, and he was placed into an asylum for the insane, the same asylum as his mother-in-law was committed to. Young Bernabe was made a ward of the Catholic Church and grew up to become a fine, strong man and an even better priest. Kind, patient, and noble, in time he was able to rebuild his life, and if not forget, move on from that awful morning when he was eight years old. Only one thing makes him wake up drenched in sweat, crying out in the dark. He sometimes dreams of his old family's house, and he can see everything as clear as he could that day, but what wakes him up petrified is remembering the foul smell, the unmistakable smell of sulfur. The Man in the Corner From Matthew's Interviews I unfortunately can't remember the exact day, but this happened around 10.30 p.m. Zay, my son, would not go to sleep as he was restless and fighting his usual sleep schedule. Kids, what are you going to do? Anyway, because his mom was in the kitchen making dinner when we decided to spontaneously wake, I decided to focus on getting him back to sleep. I picked him up out of his crib, and I, I thought I saw a person a human-shaped shadow in the corner of the room. But because I was moving so fast to get him and make a bottle, I didn't notice too much. After trying to sit down on the couch and feed him his bottle on the couch, I realized that wasn't going to work. So I let my wife know that I was going to go into his bedroom and try to feed him and get him to sleep. So I went in and sat down in my rocking chair. I tried to feed him with the door to the kitchen open. After realizing that it was not going to work with the door open, I stood up and walked over to the door and shut it. The room became pitch black. I should make it clear now that I'm not afraid of the dark. I shut the door and sat back down in the rocking chair and started to rock, back and forth, back and forth, hoping I could get Zay to sleep. He kept on moving side to side, trying to get comfortable, and as he did so, I looked up to try to give him more space to lay his head on my chest. As I picked up my head, I looked toward the corner of the room, and I saw a human-like figure form from the floor and just stand ominously in the corner. At that moment, I didn't feel scared, more protective than anything. I wanted to ask it why it was here, but out of respect and tiredness, and not wanting to wake my son, I just stared at it, and it stared back at me. Ten to fifteen minutes went by, of me just rocking in the chair, and staring at this thing, and it just stared back at me and never moved. Then my cat Misty pushed open the door, and as soon as the light hit it, I watched it dissipate into nothing. It was gone and the cat pushing the door open woke Zay up. So I shooed her out of the room and closed the door, all while holding Zane. I sat back down and looked at the corner as Zane put his little head to my chest and fell back to sleep. The thing again formed out of the floor, and once more we continued to just stare at each other. Five minutes went by and again my cat opened the door and it was gone as soon as the light from the kitchen hit it. This time I decided to leave the room with Zay in my arms and his bottle in my right hand. That was the last time I saw it. It still lingers around. Both my wife and I feel it in his room every time we go in there, day or night. Whoever or whatever it is, though, doesn't seem to be malicious. There's something in the forests of Franklin, Maine. From Justice Phaser. This happened about three years ago. I was on a trip with my great aunt, let's call her Eva, and many other family members. 
We would have big cookouts at the family camp every summer, and they always brought me the best of memories. That summer was difficult for many reasons, so that trip to the camp was exactly what I needed. We had burgers, hot dogs, and watermelon, the ingredients for a perfect cookout. That day was wonderful for me, but that night was when I realized that the old tales my great-grandmother told me may have been true. When the night came, we had many choices of where to sleep, either one of the two campers, Eva's car, or the camp house. I chose one of the campers that night. Most of my family chose the camp house, and a couple of my cousins chose the camper behind the one I was sleeping in. I think I slept for at least an hour before I heard scratching at the camper. At first, I thought it was one of my cousins, so I yelled out for them to stop that I was trying to sleep in here. Of course, it didn't stop, and I was getting very angry. So, like the stupid teen I was, I stormed to the door and opened it. All I saw was a blur of brown fur run into the woods near the camper I was in. I screamed and fell back, hitting my head in the process. I got up and slammed the door closed as I heard my two cousins, John and Carl, yell, Bear! But that's the thing. I saw the creature, and it had the tail of a wolf and the face of a cat. It was no bear. Then I remembered a tale my great-grandmother told me. It was the legend of an alchemist who created a homunculus to take revenge on a town who tried to kill her for praying to gods the town deemed fake. The creature in the story was a combination of a brown bear, a coyote, and a mountain lion. After recalling this, I was even more afraid. I knew the two creatures are the same, but sadly my family didn't believe me. They were certain it was just a bear, but I think there's something in those woods, and I don't believe it's friendly. The Reason I'm Never Going Back to Russia From Olgard, the Drunk I lived in Russia practically all my life. Only recently, my family and I moved to Sweden. Sometimes I miss my homeland, the deep rivers and lakes, the mountains whose peaks cut through the sky like knives, and of course, the forests, almost boundless green oceans of taiga pine trees. In Siberian taiga, not knowing the route to the nearest settlement or to any other place where there is an opportunity to hide from the crushing wind and cold, is fatal. Cold gradually gets under your clothes, then under your skin. Then it begins to pierce the flesh like needles and tear the whole body apart, starting from the toes until it takes everything away. And a shell, blackened from blood caked under the skin, will remain from the lost, unlucky traveler. In the forests, there is a huge number of wolves, bears, and other wonders that would not mind to subdue the hunger with human flesh. But since childhood, I knew that there are creatures that, in comparison, even the most fierce wolves and the most hungry bears would look like plush toys that are about to be torn apart by a dog. When I was about 16, I lived in a small city, quite close to the border of the far north of the country. The landscape consisted mainly of deep coniferous forest, but moving further northeast from the city led to the almost limitless tundra. Conditions in the tundra are similar to those in the Arctic, kilometers and kilometers of almost identical and endless plains, from which sometimes not high hills rise up, forming ridges and short mountain ranges no more than 15 kilometers in length. I rarely visited the tundra, because I tried with all my might to avoid it. The people living in it had their own legends and myths that attracted me with their grotesqueness. A lot of rules regarding hunting and fishing, dislike for strangers, and the closed nature of the peoples of the Russian tundra were caused by the environment in which these people lived. During the winter, the tundra turns into a boundless snowy wasteland through which it's impossible to move without transport. And during the summer, the whole tundra becomes a swamp, 
with a large number of deep caverns, cold water, and fast rivers crossing the entire territory. After graduating from school, I entered the university, where I was assigned to the faculty of geology. It was difficult to call it a university, but there was no opportunity to enter a larger and more prestigious education facility. I never finished it because I moved with my family to Sweden, but over time learning there, I repeatedly had to go to practice in the tundra, because the Russian north is rich not only in fish, but also in oil. In the spring, immediately after the snow melted and a few months before the end of the semester, I was admitted to the Geological Oil Extraction Group to conduct research and practical work to prepare for the exam and learn how to use old Soviet equipment, seismographs, percussion equipment, rock scanning systems, everything that a decent geologist needs to be able to use. Before describing the work itself, I would like to tell you more about the city which I lived in and studied. There are many dozens of cities like mine in the whole of Russia. People from other regions are not interested in their fate and history, rather they survive on in the remote wilderness. There are no airports and the train routes go through them without stopping for a long time. People that do get off at such stops get out of warm cars behind foggy glass just to smoke a cigarette or buy something to eat on the road. Such towns do not have a city center or cultural heritage. They appeared when the leader of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union gave the command to expand small villages in the middle of the taiga for the sake of forestry. The villages were gradually overgrown with not tall apartment buildings, factories that smelled of smoke and burnt plastic, posters about a joyful future that got erased and faded over time. When an ugly city grew up on the territory of a former village, the revolution left it and only a smoking and sulfur-smelling grayness remained. My city has not changed since the collapse of the USSR. Reforms did not reach it, and instead of modern planned development, the city was overgrown with only an even larger number of factories and Khrushchevkas, small and ugly gray apartment buildings, that spawned like toadstools after an autumn rain. One spring morning, having already collected all the necessary things, I rode by bus through the streets, covered with melting snow. The way was long from the station to the urban-type village where the equipment and the beginning of rough terrain was located. From there was a three-hour trip on an all-terrain vehicle to the beginning of the real tundra, and the last part of the way I had to travel on a rotary tractor, which in its appearance looked more like a tank. The first part of our journey went very quickly. I met classmates from the university. We got on the train. We drank black tea with a small amount of cognac diluted in it throughout the entire ride. In those few hours while we were riding to the station in an urban-type settlement, the whole journey seemed so calm. Everyone was happy to leave the cramped streets of a provincial town and finally feel like brave explorers that moved into unknown lands. But no one knew what awaited us in this endless green and frosty hell. Above the squat, miserable town, thin black streams of smoke rose, which were difficult to distinguish against the background of gloomy thin tree trunks, with which the entire suburb was overgrown. The depressing atmosphere hanging over the city was dispelled by the sound of a guitar, from which familiar songs that every student knows flowed. As we listened, the taste of alcohol unpleasantly settled under our tongues, but would soon disperse with the bitterness of herbal tea that looked more like tar. Upon arrival, we met a second group, consisting of real geologists and our professor, a man of about 35 years old. We then got into Jeeps and Neva 4x4s, as well as several other models of SUVs that I am not sure of. We were then on our way to the point the last settlement before the tundra. I soon got into a conversation with one of the geologists. He was not an oil man and was mainly engaged in the study of caves and groundwater that flowed under the tundra. He talked about the fact that, due to the constant freezing and thawing of a large amount of water here, the layers of the earth are dotted with hundreds of small cavities, holes, channels, and other soil deformations. Some of them have existed for several thousand years, and do not look like cracks, but like cave systems. 
The road was uncommonly difficult. The city disappeared from sight and even smog was no longer visible. Stones and ground defects covered the road, which caused the wheels to constantly rattle and jump on every bump. Upon arrival to a small village, a convoy of several modified tracked army vehicles appeared before our eyes. At the head was a squat car on rotors that tore the soil under them. But most of all, I was struck by the so-called Harkov Chanka, a large tracked all-terrain vehicle resembling a mobile fortress which contained three rooms. Behind it, there were two powerful Arctic all-terrain trucks loaded with equipment and supplies for two weeks. It should have been enough. We didn't have to wait long. We set off about two hours after arrival. I got into the leading rotary tractor, having previously left my things in the Horkov Chanka. Six hours of travel through the same landscapes accompanied by the hum of engines and the smell of diesel fuel awaited us. The road train moved slowly and accurately. Under rotors, squat dwarf birches fell and got crumpled almost turning into dust and rubbish. Having finally reached the place, it had already gotten dark, and it was decided to start work tomorrow, spending the night in the cars, disassembling packages and preparing the equipment for work. The night was hard. Everyone slept in their clothes, because to keep the cabin warm, it was necessary to keep the engine running, and this consumed a lot of fuel, so we were given a prototype radiator in the room which practically didn't help. The silence was so deafening that we had to hum something to ourselves to fall asleep. For those ears accustomed to the noise of the streets, such a change of perception was a novelty. The first week of work was quite successful and calm. We were able to measure all the necessary indicators, analyze soil and ice, lay plans for groundwater routes. We even went down into one of the caves, and climbed one of the hills. By the end of the first week, it was decided to move to the area that was closer to the sea. That journey took us about a day. The next point was already beyond the Arctic Circle, and snow was added to the wet soil. There was even more ice. Almost any vegetation that reached me, at least to the ankle, disappeared. In some places there was no grass at all, only bare stone. We stopped seeing and meeting reindeer herders, and we no longer got communications with other people. Due to fatigue and a long journey, everyone became much more nervous and gloomy. We practically ran out of alcohol and we had nothing to drink before going to bed. Even the most cheerful of us would seem to turn gray from being here. It's difficult to understand where you are when both sky, water, and ground are the same color, equally greenish-gray. About five days before returning home, I saw for the first time something that made me a heavy smoker and made my hand shake every time I remembered it. At night, after a long working day, it was difficult for me to fall asleep. The songs that I'd hummed so as to not fall asleep in silence reverberated in my mind, making it even more difficult to sleep. I went out onto the porch of the Harkov Chanka to smoke, and I saw some kind of movement on one of the nearby hills. The night was cloudless, and it was not difficult to see the silhouette of something. An indistinct shadow crawled along the top. Long limbs appeared over it every now and then, as if before moving, it would throw long legs and arms forward, then pull up something behind it. Whatever that was, it seemed to be heavy and irregularly formed as if there were some rags being stretched along the ground behind it. The creature climbed a large boulder, then stopped. A second later, it seemed to tear a large piece from what was being dragged behind it. I could see antlers now, similar to a deer on the torn piece. The dragger itself, this creature, it was not big and heavy, and yet it had been dragging the body of a deer. The creature twisted, and I saw the long limbs straighten. In shape, it resembled a very thin horse with long spider-like legs that ended in claws. This thing appeared to be catching its breath. Then it pounced on the carcass of the deer. Even from where I was, I could hear the bones crunching. 
I stood there in horror. I'd never seen a living creature devour its prey with such malice. The next second, my blood turned to ice. I heard the cry of a deer. That thing had been dragging no corpse. The deer that was its prey was still alive. It screamed and tried to escape, choking on blood, but there was another sound in the background. A sound, I swear, reminded me of laughter. Disgusting laughter with a grinding to it. There was no fun in it. It sounded like a highly distorted hyena laugh, mixed with the laughs of a sick old man. I felt the gaze of the creature on me now, but it didn't stop eating. I could feel it, looking directly at me. The deer continued to scream. After about a minute, only a bunch of bloody meat remained from where the deer's body used to be. The creature pulled its head out of the corpse. Its head was as long as a horse's. It looked directly at me and laughed with the most terrible laugh I'd ever heard. It instantly jumped off the hill. Its descent took it no more than five seconds. Then, without hesitation, it ran straight in my direction. I didn't even hear the sound of footsteps. Only its laugh. I threw my cigarette on the ground and ran back into the Harkov Chanka. Until the end of the night, I heard a quiet laugh around the whole machine. It rubbed against the walls and sometimes stopped right at my bed and laughed quietly, reminding me that it was out there. Closer to the morning, all sounds stopped, but that laughter would ring in my ears for a time. In the morning, we managed to find the deer carcass, torn to shreds. There were no traces or any damage on the machine itself that could indicate the events of the previous night. Until the end of the work, several times I heard a quiet howl somewhere in the distance. Sometimes we'd find traces of the presence of a nocturnal creature. Mutilated carcasses of deer. But otherwise, it would stay quiet. About a day before the departure, we stayed in the tundra until dark, and we had to go back to the Harkovchanka at night. Throughout the entire journey, I felt a strong sense of a presence out there. I knew that in the darkness, no one took notice of the thin, shiny body of that beast, but I knew it was right behind us. Only when I got to the transport would I feel calm, but the feeling of its presence didn't disappear. I needed to complete some preparation of the equipment for transport, and I delayed another 15 minutes or so. Those were the most eerie 15 minutes of my entire life. I was standing under the light of several bright lamps that illuminated the Harkov Chanka. Finally finishing the packing of the equipment, I suddenly felt someone looking at me. I turned around and saw it. The creature sat like a dog about 10 meters from me, right on the border with the light of the lamps. Its long hind legs folded, bending in several places, resting its forelimbs on the ground. It supported its thin, black, and bald body. On the back, there was something that looked like short fur, but the rest of the body resembled dried black skin. Its muzzle was long and thin, its eyes colorless, but there was awareness in them. The feeling was as if I was looking into the eyes of a person. It smiled, broadly, viciously, but it did not move. It just stared, intently, as if understanding what I felt, as if it was enjoying my helplessness. I knew that there was no longer an opportunity to run. It was only one leap away from tearing me apart. I began to slowly move towards the door to hide from it, but then it got up, and for the first time I saw how truly big it was. Long, thin legs lifted the creature's body. It was about three meters tall. Quietly and calmly, it began to approach me, cutting off my way to the door. Its mouth opened, and I heard a voice. It wasn't specific words, only a muffled female scream. It changed, distorted, changing tones, in the next second, its claw twitched and struck my leg with a sharp and sudden movement. I felt excruciating pain. 
as if I'd been doused with acid. The wound began to hiss and boil. Blood immediately started to pour from it. The creature laughed loudly and protractedly, changing its tones and voices, and after a few seconds of such torture, I heard quiet clicks come from the cockpit. The creature stopped laughing and looked at the side window. A shot rang out immediately, then ran away with quick leaps. It soon disappeared into the darkness of the tundra. The driver got out of the cab and calmly said to me, It doesn't like lead. The shot woke up the others and they ran outside. Once I was carried into the Harkov Chanka, they dressed my wound, and at the request of my savior, I simply said that I was attacked by a wolf. On the way home, I talked to the driver. He said that the creature that attacked me is known as a Drekovic. Many also call him Volkolak, which can be roughly translated as like a wolf. He told me that the creature rarely appears, and that it marks the victims with scratches and bites, which it can pursue for a long time. It is said to rarely leave the tundra, but it will not leave the travelers who managed to escape from it once. It's capable of destroying the entire camp, and can tear much of anything to pieces, either deer or people. It doesn't eat its victims completely. It eats away all the organs from the abdomen, then mutilates the rest to show its power and dominance. It marks its territory with mutilated corpses of animals, and forever remembers all the blood of those it has killed. It can mimic the voice of a man or a deer, but it is not capable of speech. A long time ago, perhaps several decades, it was entombed inside the cave in which it lived, but not long before our arrival. The ground was washed away by water from the melted snow, and it was released. During that time it was free, it killed a large number of deer, and even a few people. The driver said that there is no protection from it. Somehow, it's impossible to kill completely, and that even by attempting to destroy it, you could only make things worse for yourself. The spirit of the slain monster would turn into a hem, a vengeful spirit, that brings nightmares and plague, feeding on the suffering of all whom it has chosen as its victims. Him are capable of destroying an entire village, leading the inhabitants to suicide. There are a large number of similar spirits, Poncha, Liho, and others. Even now my wound continues to hurt, and has not properly healed. From time to time it bleeds, and I wear a tight bandage over my leg, People who wonder about it, I simply tell them I had an open fracture that didn't heal properly. But every time my leg suddenly starts to hurt unbearably, I know that Drekovic remembered the taste of my blood, even though I now live in Sweden. Sometimes when I close my eyes, I hear a quiet, distorted laughter somewhere in the depths of my subconscious, and I know that it is looking for me. Because it does not forget its victims, and when it finds me, it will gnaw out my intestines while laughing in my voice. <laughs>